say what, what a, a fantastic good man, man, what a good this, man. This, this was. Yes. Now, let's get on to health issues. And very briefly, I just want to highlight again and ask Debbie for comments. Uh, the latest all-cause mortality statistics. Because if we look at this this graph as it's building, uh, as, as if we look from the middle of 2021 onwards, we are seeing huge quantities of uh, excess mortality month after month, after week after week after week, in fact. Uh, and Debbie, this is not being solved. And yet there doesn't seem to be any concern from anybody in the mainstream press. We see the occasional article from time to time, but no demands uh, about dealing this the way that we had demands about dealing with uh, potential excess mortality as a result of COVID-19. Uh, this just continues to, to uh, cause me difficulty because in the meantime, we're uh, gathering all kinds of genomic information. And it seems to me that what's happening is we're just data gathering and not really caring too much about whether people are really living or dying. Um, yeah, good afternoon. Um, and yes, you're exactly spot on, Mike. This is all to do with genomic sequencing, tracking, tracing, surveillance. And that's what we're going to come on to. And, and my apologies, I'm on a different device. So if I look as though I'm in a cave, I'm really not. It's just that the camera quality on the laptop is a bit different. So apologies for that. So let's just jump in and see what's happening with the WHO and also sequencing, genomic sequencing and tracking and tracing. So I discovered this document, Strengthening the Global Architecture for Health Emergency Preparedness, Respondence, Response and Resilience. Now, I have to say very quickly, the H-E-P-R-R -R there, the Health Emergency Preparedness, Response and Resilience, that is a whole new department of its own. And we will come on to that in future news. But just to make you aware that that's another department within the WHO. Now, I found four scenarios for the future of pandemics and epidemics in the next three to five years. And I just want to highlight that this isn't, we're not just talking about pandemics here, we're talking about epidemics. And for those of um, our members who are going to be able to join us for extra, that will all make much more sense if you if you are able to join us for extra, because I have got some questions I'd like to ask our audience. But this is all to do with the expanded One Health surveillance. And these scenarios, well, let's have a look at them. There are four very, very short ones. Um, and I have to say the titles, well, I'll let you be the judge of the titles. Let's look at scenario number one, happy days. Through collaboration, focus, determination, community empowerment and hard work, humanity was able to manage the pandemic. Annual booster shots, combined with vaccinations for the flu, ensure that mortality rate from COVID-19 is very small and no higher than the mortality rate of other pathogens. In 2024, the WHO helped prevent the outbreak of another novel coronavirus in Eastern Europe, quickly containing the outbreak and preventing international spread. In 2025, the second generation of vaccines managed to completely contain virus transmission. Other vaccines delivered in pill form further enabled enhanced distribution, reach and affordability. False information about the pandemic is effectively countered and nations and healthcare organisations operate based on coordinated common truth campaigns with consistent scientific messaging and guidance. None of the progress that was made following the COVID-19 outbreak would have been possible without a spirit of science-driven decision-making and strategic collaboration between nations worldwide. Debbie, coordinated common truth campaigns, that's propaganda. <laughs> Excuse me. And well, that's only, that's only scenario one, Mike. I mean, we have to make up our minds which scenarios we're going to. So with that in mind, let's flip to scenario two. I love you. I hate you. The virus remains and it's evolving. Humanity has gradually learned to live with the virus, yet still clings to pre-pandemic behaviors and approaches. New variants appear frequently, which the first generation of vaccines are ineffective against. 
Through constant testing and continually updated vaccines, the WHO and some countries managed to prevent several additional pandemic waves. But affordability and reliability of rapid tests are still an issue. Trust in governments and public institutions varies across the world. Some attribute the protracted nature of the pandemic solely to the inability of their leaders to make rapid, informed and inclusive decisions. The boundaries between digital and physical environments are blurred, with hybrid ways of working, meeting and learning now the norm. Nations are still heavily reliant on fossil fuels, and deforestation prevention has not met the desired targets. Wow. So that's scenario two. Sorry, did you want to comment there, gentlemen? Uh, I only just said, wow. Uh, I disagree that there's <laughs> trust. Var trust of governments varies across the world. It's clearly at rock bottom wherever you go. But yeah, go ahead. Well, let's let's flip forward to scenario three: heartbreak hotel. The COVID-19 pandemic is not over, and the virus has evolved, becoming even more infectious. New, more threatening variants emerge frequently, leaving vaccine manufacturers struggling to keep up. Long COVID-19 symptoms are the norm for almost everyone who gets infected, putting a significant strain on economies, productivity and healthcare systems. Each nation focuses their efforts on different fronts, some focus on measures to inform and educate the public in efforts to reduce transmission, while others focus on reopening their economy, barely able to support their overburdened health systems. Vaccines are the only treatment and prevention option, but access to them depends on the region and country. A large part of the global population is still unvaccinated, with vaccine nationalism and vaccine distribution bias against some minority groups on the rise. The world is suffering from the lack of a unified front to battle the worsening climate emergency. The WHO and the UN are no longer a forum of transparent discussion and collaboration. And finally, scenario four, here comes trouble. In addition to a worsening COVID-19 pandemic, a Zika-like vector-borne virus carried by mosquitoes spreads throughout the world. Nations struggle to establish public health measures that do not contradict each other. There is widespread confusion and conflicting priorities about what to do to protect from COVID-19 and the new virus. Given the inability of governments to inform, people turn to those who would provide reassurance during the double pandemic. Trust in society and science has never been lower. Due to intense border restrictions, the aviation and tourism industries have collapsed. People abandon towns in areas with high mosquito density and move to other areas, causing a strain on infrastructure. Healthcare systems, affected by rising cases, backlogs and staff shortages, find it nearly impossible to cope. Those with higher incomes can afford better care at better staffed facilities. Overall, environmental degradation is accelerating. Species go extinct, and those who survive will be the carriers for the next pandemic. So yesterday, Steve Barclay was talking to Tedros and they were having a big meeting. And you probably, many of our viewers and listeners will already know that the global vaccine passport agenda is very much on. So which scenario do you think we're heading for? Or maybe a little bit of all of it? Or are we seeing it right now? Yeah. Well, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think we're probably going to see a little bit of all of it. I mean, there's quite a visceral response to that in the chat box. And, and a lot of people uh, saying, uh, questioning, how could anybody fall for this stuff? Uh, and of course, the reason that people are falling for it is because of the sheer determination by the mainstream press to bombard everybody with so much of this type of material. Now, for can, can I just add to yes. that, Mike? But it's also in cartoon format. So it's specifically targeted at children 
And what you're, what you're doing is reframing children to believe this nonsense. So a couple, couple of our members of our audience have said, why is the UK column showing you this? We're showing you this because this is the propaganda that's being targeted at the minds of our children, our grandchildren both in the UK and, 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 of course, in countries worldwide. We need to show this because this is the attack. And we're hoping that perhaps it might motivate a few people to... to Stand up, yeah, challenge it. Challenge it. So, OK, Debbie. Yeah, and I'd like to say, too, I think what we're trying to show is that a lot of this agenda is surveillance. It's knowing where we are, what we're doing what we're eating, how our bodies are working. This is all about surveillance. And we're coming straight on to the O'Shaughnessy review. And we've talked about this before, but the government gave a response last week. And I just wanted to, to highlight it because the O'Shaughnessy review actually gives the green light to the MHRA to do pretty much what they want. So let's have a look and see what the O'Shaughnessy review is actually about. You can see there that the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency Health Research Authority. Now, the HRA, I'm just going to highlight that in brackets because we'll, come, we'll talk about that at a future date. But that, again, is another organisation within the NHS that most people haven't heard about. So this this is a collaboration between the MHRA and the Health Research Authority and other system leaders should set up a rapid task and finish group to produce a plan on reducing the regulatory burden of approving trials and removing delays in setup, including with the goal of reaching a 60 day turnaround time for all approvals. Now, it also says at the bottom there, recommendation five, the MHRA the HRA and the NIHR and its equivalent organisations across the UK should collect, consolidate and publish national monthly returns on all the clinical trials activity that is happening in the NHS and NHS bodies and commercial sponsors should publish numbers of patients in trials on a monthly basis. Now, I just want to look very, very quickly a little bit deeper into the O'Shaughnessy review. And I've got another slide and I've underlined the most important, well, I mean, the whole report, to be honest, people need to go and look at. But I've underlined a little bit there that says the UK was ranked fourth in the number of commercial phase one trials initiated in 2021 behind the USA, China and Australia. The UK's ranking fell to 10th for commercial phase three trials. We have heard from industry that the UK is viewed as an unreliable and unpredictable partner. Our approvals processes are theoretically competitive, but inconsistent because of backlogs at the MHRA and unnecessary site level approval processes, which create delays. One major global pharmaceutical company that submitted evidence to the review said that of the 16 European countries in which it carried out research, the UK was the second slowest for setting up clinical trials. This is clearly unacceptable for a country with our resources and ambitions. And then it went on to say, given the need for efficient and fast review of trials, the HRA's new fast track service offers a 50% faster ethics approval to provide a consistent and efficient approval process. This has been shown to substantially reduce the period for ethics approval with a median time of 16 days in August 2022 and 27 days in September 2022. In March 2023, the MHRA also set new targets for application reviews within a maximum of 30 days in general, with a maximum 10 calendar days for a decision to be granted, granted once the regulator has any final information. Now, this is accelerating things very quickly, and this O'Shaughnessy review has basically given the MHRA the green light to speed everything up, and we know that they're desperate to get your data from clinical trials. So I've been looking at what GPs have been doing just recently. And in GP, you'll see there that GPs could now be incentivized to recruit patients onto commercial clinical trials. Also in the evening standard, we found out that how many, uh, 246,000 Londoners 
have taken part in research in 2022 to 2023. That's a huge figure for one area, and it's been supported by the NIHR, of course, and these are volunteers. So what else are they doing at GP surgeries? Well, they're doing new cancer testing, but these cancer testing that this is this is a tablet on a piece of string that you swallow, um, and in twenty minutes, what they do is it, it's a little sponge and it inflates in your tummy, and then they pull it back out and they're taking cells from your esophagus for genomic screening. Of course, it's called the cyto sponge. So these are new tests that are being rolled out in our GP surgeries, which can be done in about twenty minutes. We've also got Moderna rolling out trials with GP surgeries. And we've got, thank you for all the viewers um, that sent me this, the Wandsford and King's Cliff practice are to hold a Moderna COVID vaccine trial. These are GPs now taking part in COVID vaccine trials. It says it's the trial is open to people at least 12 years old who have already received a COVID-19 vaccine. And if over 18 at least one booster dose. So they're looking for as many people to take place in the next COVE study. Now I went to look at the next COVE study and I just want you to see what the um, trial is all about. This is a clinical trial of an investigational COVID-19 vaccine for adults and teens over 12. It says you or your child, along with 8,472 other individuals, will be helping researchers learn more about Moderna's latest investigational vaccine that may protect people, may, I should highlight there, may protect people from getting sick if they come into contact with the virus, if they come into contact with the virus in inverted commas. You or your child's participation could contribute to a potential solution to the evolving COVID-19 pandemic, which has affected the entire world. Now, if you just flip on again, it'll show you the eligibility criteria and it'll show you what to expect. And you're looking at a study which will last for 13 months. And you're looking also for this investigational vaccine may be given or it could be the original Moderna vaccine, but you're not to know which one it will be. So you or your child will be chosen at random to receive either the investigational booster dose of mRNA 1283222 or mRNA 1273222, and they'll compare. Now, these are for children these are children over the age of 12, and I think it's absolutely terrifying. And the number of trials that are ongoing at the moment, I think we all need to just ask some questions to our GPs. Ask the question and find out if you're comfortable with the answers. So ask, is your data being shared? Who's it being shared with? Is your GP practice a clinical research practice? Many of them have signed up to become clinical research practices. Now, that's slightly different from the next question, which is, is my GP surgery signed up to the MHRA? Clinical practice research data link, the CPRD. CPRD is different from a clinical research practice. So just because your surgery is signed into the clinical research practice doesn't mean to say it's necessarily signed in to CPRD as well. So check. Ask if you are participating in a clinical trial that you are unaware of. Also possibly ask, are you receiving any new novel experimental drugs, tests or therapies that haven't gone through long-term safety data? Please ask these questions. Do you receive any financial or other incentives to participate in research and data sharing? GPs clearly are being incentivized. So are they receiving any financial incentives? And if so, what? Or maybe they're getting sabbaticals or holidays or I don't know. Ask if they're receiving anything. Have they signed any non-disclosure agreements? Now, I know that a lot of GP surgeries have. Um, and maybe you'd like to ask your GP surgery have they signed into any non-disclosure agreements? And if so, who with? And perhaps ask, 
what happens to your data, the specimens that you're giving, your DNA effectively, your confidential medical information? Where is that actually going? Does does anybody know? Is anybody asking the questions? Because I really do believe that people need to be just asking questions of where your data is going, because clearly this is surveillance. I looked into one more um, trial that's currently going on at the moment called Heal COVID, um, which is a trial looking at long COVID. Um, and there's a lot more to come on long COVID. And you can see the collaboration there with the NIHR, the University of Cambridge, the University of Liverpool, plenty of other names. And, and lastly, finally, on this particular segment, I just want to end with, um, for many years now in England, we've all been opted in to transplant and organ donation. But as of the 1st of June, um, I might need your help here, Mike, on the pronunciation, as this is Northern Ireland. Um, but as of the 1st of June, all adults in Northern Ireland will now be considered potential organ donors unless they choose to opt out or are in an excluded group. Now, this opt-out clause, these opt-out clauses are called sludge techniques. Unlike nudge techniques, they're called sludge. So that's just a heads up for those of you in Northern Ireland. Sorry, I do apologize. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. Um, uh, just a button issue in the studio. Uh, just wanted to say, Debbie, thank you very much for taking us through that. It, it, very, very interesting, and it should be immensely worrying to any right-thinking person in UK, um, particularly that we are experimenting on children 12 and above. Uh, but the questions that you put on screen, we're going to encourage our audience to go back, have a look at um, this news when it's posted on the website. Um, we'll make sure you can find Debbie's questions easily, and we hope that you will consider using these in order to, one, protect yourself, but also to find out more about what is going on in the NHS and the GP surgery. So we're going to say a big thank you for that, Debbie. We're also going to say that we'll hold the I section because we know you've got some, um, some really um, dynamite reports on what's been happening around people's eyes and damage to eyes, but we'll hold that for another news. Um, so we, we're going to end at the moment, but we'll just end on this uh, one. Well, it's a report, but I couldn't resist it, really. Let's pop it on screen and see what it says. UK's top spy mistakes parody Twitter account for real. MI6 Chief Richard Moore failed to notice that Turkey's new foreign minister does not have a real Twitter profile. The head of the UK's Foreign Intelligence Service, Richard Moore, has revealed that he does not pay much attention to profile descriptions on Twitter after he accidentally tagged a parody account of Turkey's new foreign minister, Mr Fadan. In a late Sunday tweet, Moore set out congratula a congratulatory message to Fadan, wishing my friend and former colleague good luck in his new position as a minister in, Ado in Adogan's new cabinet. However, Moore seemingly failed to realise that his friend never had a Twitter account and he linked to a parody profile in the message, which was quickly pointed out to the top spy by dozens of net citizens. Uh, he did then post, a, oh, I've made a mistake. Um, but um, does it tell us about the people that are currently apparently protecting us? Did they I've ever described protect him us? as a donkey, but uh, yes. maybe that's a little bit unkind. I'm not sure they ever protected us. <laughs> Richard Dearlove certainly didn't protect us when he... Uh, no. Started talking about yellow cake, but anyway, let's. Uh... Uh, interestingly, that was reported by uh, Russia Today, uh, but the other location I found it on was uh, the New Zealand Telegraph. Now, whether it's appeared in uh, Western press or UK press, I don't know, but I could imagine these. Are, this is one of the stories that uh, they wouldn't want to report to save um, the embarrassment. Mm. 
Okay, we'll leave leave it there. Debbie, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to everybody who's joined us today to listen or watch the news. Uh, now, I'm going to say two things. One in the extra time coming up in a couple of minutes. Uh, Debbie is going to be taking us through some particular issues to do with health and medical matters. And she's specifically going to be asking for help from UK column viewers. So if you can join us in that members extra um, segment, we'd be delighted to see you. And we're also going to say that over a number of weeks, we've hinted that we've got good news for our audience. And Wednesday next week, we will be having a special extra time to take you through what's happening with UK Column in the future. We think this is immensely exciting and uh, we could never have done it without all of the help that our members have given. So if you can remember to join us Wednesday next week for UK Column Extra, uh, we've got lots of good news to share with you. We'll end there. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes for today's extra time. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.